if you're treated with great reverence, or are you kind of still like trying to fight to, with the V8 guys? I think since Project I, they get it. I mean, I don't think it's a problem to um, to get them to understand that this is coming. There's no one's fighting this anymore. Really. It's like everyone's on board. We have, like, like I was saying, we have you know 25 new models coming. So it's, I, I don't, I don't feel like we have to fight for it anymore. The, and one of those models coming is the X3. You're not giving anything up. It's already been announced. Mm -hmm. It's coming yeah. in 2020. Yeah. It's part of the kind of onslaught of German luxury vehicles that are electrified that are about to hit. Mm -hmm. We've seen the first one uh, just announced here in San Francisco just a few weeks ago, the Audi e-tron, uh, an SUV that's going to hit the market soon, and then another European luxury car, the Jaguar uh, SUV, is in showrooms uh, shortly. Um, so we're seeing that kind of religion there. If we go on to the the automotive supplier, what is it like in both worlds? You, your your company is supplying to the traditional OEM, but you're also looking for these new these new competitors. How do you see the mindset being different on electric cars at this point? Uh, there's a different mindset. I think the sense of urgency in, in the electrical and startup world world is higher than in the traditional companies. Uh, but of course, the traditional OEMs are also waking up, and, and this is a trend uh, that they are uh, catching on to. So we have to work with both sides. Eric? Yeah, no, that mic doesn't seem to be yeah. working as well as the other there mics. You know. Thank you. <laughs> I'll have to hold it. Eric, is the way to be in electric cars luxury? Does it have to be a luxury car? It doesn't have to be, but um, certainly it will work for our customers well. Uh, there's a whole bandwidth of vehicles out there today. Um, the only issue is that you can't find a luxury electric vehicle out there right now. Uh, you don't really find an awesome budget electric vehicle out there either in high quantity, so I think it's going to be a very diverse market. We are trying to play in the luxury segment. Last but not least, you're going for a more mainstream consumer. Maybe tell, tell us a little bit more. <coughs> this isn't the Model S of the world. This is more of the Model 3 kind of SUV segment of the world. Indeed. So I, I really um, believe that finally um, if you'd like to kind of really get into the market, then well, I, I've seen kind of the tension between trying to kind of bring a 7 series down to a 3 series and, you know, do the same thing on the same line, uh, to simply manufacture all of these on the same line. And you finally always end up with, okay, well, the, the, the 3 series finally, 10 years later, becomes a little bit too big, a little bit too heavy, and a little bit too expensive. Well, the other way around, you try to simply kind of compete with a platform which is a 3 series and just, you know, try to grow it up. Um, to, to a 7 series and finally just get to the boundaries, etc. So we just saw, okay, why not jumping right, right into the sweet spot? And if you would like to do kind of mass manufacturing, then, mm. you know, um, I was just thinking about, okay, how many people today can afford a car like, you know, 100k plus? It's not too many, obviously. So we said, okay, if you really would like to get into mass production, then you need to obviously work out for exactly the price positioning. So price positioning to us is one of the, of the key things you really need to kind of take care of. So that's why Bonton tries to really position themselves about 40, 50K entry price level. And, and the second thing which I would like to add in terms of, you know, electric powertrain, yes or no, mandatory, yes or no. To my understanding, electric powertrain is, is much more than just replacing a combustion engine with an EV engine because uh, overall, the electric powertrain is the, the enabler in terms of engineering language for very, very many different things. So as an example, we, for example, managed just to get, for example, rid of the um, AC compressor. So if the <coughs> AC uh, big thing, which is always usually between you and your passenger, is driving. This big thing just, you know, goes in front of the firewall and is gone because we can bring down the e-machine to a significantly smaller size. You can swivel seats, you don't have bathtubs, so just have a plain floor. Mm -hmm. So that's in the end just one of the one of the big chances of the kind of to rethink the entire car. It looks like just a detail, but it's the enabler for very many things in the car. Let's go through the line here again and talk about what is holding back electric cars at this point. So we just kind of talked about the mindset of the OEM, the car maker, but is it because electric cars are so much more expensive at this point? Or is it consumer mindset that these things are something you have to compromise on? I mean, I'm sure you all have a perspective on this. Maybe we start off, how much does it add to the cost of bill for having an electric vehicle? Maybe just grab it one of the aspects and then I'll leave the rest of the panel. Uh, so it's one of the major aspects I, I actually experienced was um, it's very important whether you talk about electric cars or you use them. 
it really makes a huge difference. Let's take one example, uh, which you already mentioned earlier, uh, and Stefan mentioned it earlier, which was um, actually the charging. So we just had recently a discussion, actually um, last weekend, a discussion with a couple of electronauts. So, so people we know from 15 years ago, which have been using Mini E's and Active E's and EI3's and Tesla's for now many years, something like 10 to 15 years. And if you ask them, okay, how often do you kind of use public charging? They come up with numbers like three to five percent, which is not too much as long as you've got a chance, for example, to charge at home. So then finally, what is the answer behind it? Okay, what do we exactly need and, and, and how often? And they just come up with, okay, level three charging, and I need to know in advance where they are. And even kind of today, that's uh, good enough for me for kind of these um, 10 to 15 times per year where I kind of go out. Now that's a, a group of people who kind of have experienced that for 10 to 15 years. But if you ask people who kind of completely unexperienced and are about to make the jump into some in uncertainty, um, then they've got totally different expectations. Their expectation is just, okay, I haven't done it before, I'm simply a little bit scared. So I think lots of that is also mindset and simply kind of, you know, doing it the very first time. And it was exactly the same thing for myself. So when I, you know, got started, then, you know, my eyes have been, you know, always up to my range, but not to speed and everything else. Um, but once I got used to it, I just, you know, uh, was kind of completely relaxed. Like, okay, you just drop the car into the garage, and next morning it's, it's kind of fully charged. It's just one aspect, but I guess a lot of that is also cultural education and, and experience. Is that at the dealership level that needs to occur, or is it a general marketing campaign? Well, I think um, overall that is, I guess, a, a social thing. So that's why, why we also focus very much on the connectivity of it. So we truly believe that one of the kind of key things we would like to kind of really uh, put into the core middle of our um, brand is actually the Biden ID, which is named, you know, just think about things like, well, I guess, you know, WhatsApp. So the Chinese version of it is, is, for example, WeChat. And WeChat is, you know, started the same way, like, okay, communications and sending messages, and that's it. And then they added, okay, exchange of documents, then they changed, then they added things like, okay, you don't need your, your phone number anymore, they don't exchange phone numbers, they just scan the QR code. Uh, next thing is payments. So there are a lot of coffees out there. You can't just you know, pay with um, actually your WeChat account, but you can't pay cash or credit card. So one by one, they added things towards this, this ID. And I truly believe that this ID thing and the, the social life around this is the community where these set of, uh, you know, uh, mindset of, of values of the changes one by one. So I truly believe it's not only about education. It's something you need to do without being forced. It's something you need to experience. Okay. Eric, at least your vehicles are going to cost Six figures. Uh, also, yes. <laughs> <laughs> does battery costs even matter? I mean, is that even is that even a concern for your consumers if it's adding an extra ten grand? Well, I would I would want to start and say nobody really uh, wants to buy an ICE per se. What do they want? They want to have a great car that can cater to their needs, whether it's holding the kids around, whether it's driving to Tao for skiing, whether it's commuting on a daily basis. But you have a certain requirement for that car, and ideally the thing looks awesome, and, and you love it. Right? So it doesn't have to be an ICE, it's just after the first wave of 1800 and early 1900 EVs, the development took off towards the ICEs, and then it just became the natural choice. Now we haven't been given any better choices going back to EVs, and that's just starting. Now that people will start or have started to realize that an electric powertrain, electric vehicle can give them as much or if not more than an ICE car, why would they choose an ICE over an EV? That's kind of where we're coming from. The electric vehicle shouldn't be a car that limits you in any ways. So. Customers want a, an awesome product, they want to identify it, they want to customize it, they have a certain range need, yes? And that's maybe the, the point of getting into it. If you realize that 99.9% .9 of the year, uh, a 200 mile range battery takes you anywhere you want to go, and only 1% you really need a little bit more, you can start thinking differently about the cost. But that's not so easy to educate people, so you have to get into it get to, to know the advantages, you never have range anxiety in a long range electric vehicle because it's always charged in the morning when you get into it. Would you think that, was that one of the big learnings you had at Tesla, this idea of 
you're not selling the car as a nerd mobile, but you're selling it as something beyond. It, it just happens to be an electric car in some ways. I mean, if you looked at the initial hybrid electric vehicles, the Prius, you were sending a statement. If you're driving a Tesla or you're driving a Lucid Air, is a different statement than, hey, you're green. It's, it's more of a luxury statement. Absolutely. We don't believe there has to be a mission statement. We know that our electric powertrain is significantly more efficient than even a Prius plug-in hybrid. Um, but you don't have to sacrifice an awesome style, awesome experience, luxury, craftsmanship, relaxation in the rear <coughs> seat, and so on. So, yeah, we, we think you should have the choice, and we are going to be the luxury choice. At Bosch, there's never any concerns about cost among your customers, I imagine. <laughs> 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 so I've got a question. <laughs> what? Luckily, yeah, there's no purchasing people. <laughs> um, is, is, that, is that what's holding back electric cars? The cost of, the, of batteries, the cost of... of I, actually, I don't think so. Um, I, I, I'm not sure I'm holding back. I think it has to do with very few people in this country have ever sat in an electrical vehicle, have ever driven it. Um, maybe a little bit more here in California, but let's say back in Michigan, people are looking at me, oh, you're getting an electric car? Um, how will that work? But once you drive an electric car, um, uh, there's a German word for, for it called Fahrspaß, the <laughs> fun of, of joy of driving. And I, to, to me, that's the most compelling thing with electrical vehicles. Can you repeat that? Fahrspass. Fahrspass. Mm -hmm. Spelling, too, please. Spelling. He's not German. Joy of driving. Um, so I think that, that eventually would be the most compelling thing. Uh, and I don't think money is the thing. Um, the economy is strong. Um, the equivalent uh, luxury cars, or even the Model 3 cars, uh, the C-Class, Mercedes, the Audis, they cost about the same. What needs to happen at BMW, or what needs to happen for traditional OEM and with electric, with batteries for the price to come down? Is it scale, or is it uh, technical change? We need to see a next generation of battery. Well, I think it's both, actually, but once we have more scale, I mean, the prices will come down, of course, but I think it's a well, sorry. Can you there were two points: the scale or uh, the tech battery technology. Yeah, I mean we need we need more energy density. We need to maintain the same safety levels, and price has to come down a little bit. But even if you look at an EV today and you look at total cost of ownership for some customers, it's actually you know on par with IC or in some cases even cheaper for certain. I mean, I'm no engineer, but en any energy density is really easy, right? You just put more energy in there. But it's to maintain the same level of safety. There needs to be some some engineering in terms of thermal management, of uh, you know, keeping uh, things like um, you know cell propagation and these topics. Like this. And I think you two have made. I know Lucid talks about having made some advancements in its cells. Why don't you two talk about? Draw straws over who's going to go first. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe I just take the chance and put in a different dimension of the entire discussion. So, so one of the aspects is very clearly speaking, I think I do agree that you know costs have been an issue for sure. So just you know, remember back 1800 something, the very first car on the road has been an electric car, not the Daimler. So and then something happened in between, and if you just look along the entire road of it. 1950s, 1960s, 70s, 80s, here and there and always pop up electric cars. So just go around the established OEMs, their lines, they always have a couple of electric cars here and there and there, but none of them made it. And I think there was clearly up to the two facts, first of all costs, and secondly energy density has simply been too low. So that was significantly one of the problems. So if you just ask me, is technology right now kind of at the tipping point or kind of close to it, then my very simple answer will be yes and it will be in a couple of years. So um, I think in terms of technology, we are kind of very close to it. And in terms of affordability, we, we are in the end just missing um, the kind of economy of scale of that. To, to the, that is one of the answers to it um, from my point of view. But a second one, which is totally different, is 
Um, one of the key things currently, which is a, a real burden when you talk about a little bit more sort of engineering language, like it's not only putting more energy into it, but then there's uh, things like, okay, you need to give a warranty. So you give out kind of a car, which doesn't come back for, for the next 15 years, and then somebody might pop up with a warranty or something. But now, just think the entry way down, like, okay, you, don't have, you do have kind of a regular, on average, utilization of your car per day, which is 3 to 5% a day. So now think about car sharing, but the utilization goes up to something like 50% a day. So then the entire you know, battery warranty thing is completely gone, because after one year, not after 10 years, but after one year, you've got kind of in the end, you know, the breakthrough. That's where the money's back after one year. So you don't need to think about battery, battery warranty anymore. And then, if this threshold, for example, drops, then obviously energy density is kind of a little bit closer to what you just said, just put a little bit more energy in it. So then the entire business model changes and the, the entire um, technology changes, and of course, then the business case and all the affordability changes as well. So that is part of the equation as well. Yeah, I would say uh, the price level is there where it needs to be, and I think one of the proponents of that change is actually the Model 3. It's coming in increasing volumes. You showed the chart. Uh, it's, uh, it's quite high up there, uh, ranking already, and they're going to pump, up, pump out more and more cars. The cost of the cells per se is, I think, at a level where we're at the tipping point. The topic of technical improvements, now we have to look into the details. Number one, the cell level. The cell level has been eked out over the last 10 years quite dramatically. And on the current lithium-ion technology, I'm not sure whether we're going to see significant improvements in the next several years on that anymore. The manufacturing processes are eked out, and, and there's just not much more to come. On the volume perspective, there's a lot of benefits that will come, and you also See that from a neighboring state, they are building a big battery factory or increasing the size of that as we go. There are uh, additional battery, f battery uh, factories in planning and they dramatically help with the scales and the cost of a high volume manufacturing. Then the second topic, if you are talking about energy density and stuffing more inside, uh, at Lucid our focus has been to stuff more energy inside the battery pack because that is something we can dramatically improve. On a cell level, I just said we are pretty much at the end, but on a battery pack level, we can stuff more cells in a smaller volume, which will give the opportunity to make smaller cars with really long ranges. So being able to package those cells fairly densely by still being mega safe, because that's uh, our main concern, of course, and then being able to fast charge and then uh, also to thermally manage the cells because there is a, a thermal dependency on the performance of a cell per se. That is going to be an area that uh, several suppliers or, or OEMs will be able to make advances. What's more important, range of the electric vehicle or the amount of time it takes to charge, to recharge the vehicle? Actually, we want to start with that one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would like to, to simply kind of say, to my opinion, these are two in the end um, variables in the same equation. So, just to give you an example, for example, kind of currently, kind of um, all the guys here along the road, um, the products kind of being offered offer something like 30 minutes, 80 percent charge. If that really happens, then finally we can obviously think about reducing the battery pack size, because you know, uh, 30 minutes, 80 percent, and you start with a fully charged car in the morning which, by the way, doesn't count fully to, to China. Not everybody in the 100, you know, um, you know building like, you know, has a, the possibility to kind of really kind of personally charge at home. But for, for the rest of the world, um, fully charged car in the morning, and obviously that, that is a kind of a significant impact into the battery pack. And we always need to take into account that still the battery packs are pretty heavy. So something like 400 kilos or 500 kilos or 600 kilos is a significant mass you need to move every day. So uh, the charging equation, to my understanding, is a very important factor to find reduce it and bring it up to an affordable level. And if you kind of, I don't know whether you've done it before personally, but I did kind of, you know, my, my daily kind of, you know, range and just put it down for um, two and a half years, actually, and just trying to figure out what is kind of my spikes and how often do I go kind of more than, you know, 50 miles a day. And that was very, very rarely. 
So I figured out the kind of, if I bought, for example, dimension, my own battery would be significantly smaller than most of what I see here in the Silicon Valley and what I, what I see with the German OEMs. 400 mile range, do you need a 400 mile range? You don't necessarily need it, as uh, Dirk just said. It depends on your use case. On a long range luxury electric vehicle, we feel it's good to have sufficient of everything, and that comes with range. Uh, we've actually sacrificed package to make the occupant package better, but we still offer that insane range. Now, once we go down market and make smaller products, then we get into the realm of mass optimization. It's more a commuter car. The use case changes, so it makes a, a lot of sense to charge fast, reduce the mass, and reduce the cost because, of course, the cell cost times amount of cells basically is, is the burden that every car is carrying with it. Pasco, when you worked on the i3, did you learn anything about what consumers think about range and anxiety, this idea that I'm going to be driving out there and run out of juice or something like that? Is it, or was it overblown in, in the end? Yeah, so I mean, if you look a little bit, it's, it's a tough question. For example, if you look at the take rate on our range extender in the US, I think it's close to 50% or maybe even, even higher on the range extender. In Europe, people are a little bit more used to shorter ranges, so we have less range extenders. And we're talking about, for example, for 2019 in Europe, not having the range extender. So that says that the customers now have been, well, we have more range now in our A3 as well. And on top of that, the customers now are more aware of how to use an EV, how to plan their days uh, accordingly. They charge at home or at work or, or something. So I think mm -hmm. the education is caught up. Let's say. I remember driving an electric car in Detroit in February and having a great deal of range anxiety. Uh, Mr. Uh, you're going to have that soon. Do you have any concerns? Um, personally, no, but um, I think uh, we will see for the quite a long time, we'll see a mix of powertrains. Uh, we will see fully EVs, we will see plug-in hybrids, um, and we will see um, fuel cell as, a, as an alternative. Um, for that takes care of that say fast charging. You can refuel a vehicle much quicker than you can charge a battery. But it depends on the use case. So for commercially um, used vehicles that go long distances every day, uh, I think there's a case for uh, these other powertrains, uh, especially the fuel cell EV. You're at the heart of the conversation about the kind of the changing idea of car ownership. We've seen the rise of Uber really changing what mobility means to people. Uh, there is this belief that perhaps ride hailing services would have perhaps benefit electric cars. Do you see some potential there to, to create a market um, for more demand for electric vehicles in, in around town uh, Ubers or potentially autonomous vehicles? Uh, yeah, uh, from the perspective of the cities, uh, there's quite a few cities around the world that are thinking of banning diesel vehicles, uh, banning uh, vehicles with combustion engines. Um, the latest I saw was Denmark looking at um, stopping sales of, of um, combustion engines from 2030. Um, so I think ride sharing is an element in that, and um, especially when you talk ride sharing and uh, automated driving. Um, the automated driving systems, uh, they need a lot of power, electrical power. So it's, it's a natural fit, uh, electrical vehicle and a self-driving robo-taxi platform. Yeah, I absolutely think that uh, shared economy, so the Ubers of the world uh, have their eyes on electric vehicles because the total cost of ownership is what matters to them most. We as private owners, let's say the luxury uh, buyers, luxury limousine buyers, not so much, but the average car buyer is a little bit investment sensitive. That's why you put the lease model and so on. You don't just go into a shop and spend $50,000 for a car. You, you think about it, it's, it's kind of an investment if you pay it down payment. A ride sharing company uh, can operate completely different because they have revenue with the car. They just lease a car and then they make money. And for them, the operating cost is what matters. Uber has to pay the driver right now. That's where Christoph mentioned autonomy will give another real big uh, benefit for them. So they have to pay for the driver, but they also have to pay for fuel and maintenance. And those are two critical factors 
that are significantly more expensive on ICE cars than on electric cars. That is an added add-on benefit for the buyers of our cars also, but in the future they'll save money on the gasoline cost. Uh, we are not going to market that but because well, yeah, they're not so price sensitive. Uh, but for a cheap car, uh, it's really important uh, that the cost of ownership model works out. Uh, the, the energy cost is about a third of that of a gasoline car. Your brakes need warranty about only half as often as an electric car because you can recuperate and the electric powertrain is significantly more uh, robust towards warranty cost from timing belts and cylinder heads and whatever can go wrong in an ICE. It's super complex an ICE car and it breaks down significantly more often than an EV. So those are, those are real considerations for the Ubers. And then the second step is going to be the autonomy. Dirk, you're working on autonomous as well. Well, right now, there's this kind of conventional wisdom that autonomous vehicles and electric vehicles will go together, like peanut butter and jelly, mm -hmm. in large part because the compute needed is going to need all that energy. Um, there are some players in the world, however, feel that maybe a hybrid uh, vehicle, that gasoline engine component of it, is really the more efficient way to get the power generated because if you're a robot taxi, you can just put some gas in real quick rather than having to get it charged up. Where do you fit in that, in that thought? I think that perhaps you probably think electric's the way to go, but... Hmm. So first, first of all, I just make kind of a very kind of a specific statement for, for Biden, um, not focusing on technology only, but on Biden itself. Well, for, for, a, for a startup, there's a couple of very good reasons why the startup companies finally decide to, to just go with one exactly exactly one technology. Um, because finally, you, you simply need to um, build up all your manufacturing lines one by one by one by one. Because if you try to combine combustion uh, um, and hybrids and AVs on the same line, you end up with very, very many compromises, which are on the one inside uh, expensive, and on the other side always kind of bad compromises in terms of technology. So there's a very good reason why all the startups just go for exactly one um, technology. So you finally need to do, choose one technology, and uh, you need to finally meet CO2 emission targets, and you start with you know one single or two or three models only, then the very simple choice is EV because there's no alternative. So that is one thing. If you just finally come back saying, okay, if, if you kind of really would like to be more effective and more efficient with combustion engines or PF or something, or to have something kind of a, a hybrid second part to, from the end, uh, have maybe two different um, um, aggregates which have, for example, different optima where they kind of can be, in the end, operated at efficiently then, of course, a hybrid to certain degrees is always a good option. And finally, it doesn't make too much difference if the, if the hybrid part of it is, for example, a fuel cell or a combustion engine. Uh, for an engineering point of view, it's just an optimization task and gives you some more degrees of freedom where to run it. So, for example, if you just run constant speed on a highway, then obviously something which is, for example, burning uh, like a fuel cell, uh, just oxygen, is kind of a very good solution, indeed. And the, the second good message actually is, right behind the fuel cell, is an EV. It's an electric car. You know, the fuel cell just produces electric energy. So it's kind of pretty easy to add in the fuel cell or not. The technology is nearly the same thing. And if you just look about you know, what's kind of the challenges, uh, for example, for combustion engines, they, well, the major technical challenges is actually if it doesn't run kind of in a stable state, but if you need to kind of shoot it up and down and up and down and up and down. So like a nuclear, nuclear plant, you can't just you know, move it up and down in the load, electrical load, all the time. You need to run in kind of a stable state. And that's exactly the same thing for a fuel cell and for a combustion engine. They can't go up very quickly up and down and up and down. If you just consider this, uh, which is kind of the, the standard requirement, for example, in the city, it's always braking, accelerating, braking, accelerating all the time. That's simply kind of badly covered by an electric powertrain. And again, you also can gain back the energy, which is not the case for some of the combustion engines. So overall, I think it's a very, you know, uh, if you kind of deep dive into technology, a very good decision to go with an electric powertrain. If you finally figure out, okay, in terms of you can afford putting in a second technology, because it's a significant cost factor to put in a second technology, if you can afford it, then you open up a couple of degrees of freedom for efficiency, and then obviously for the electric powertrain, the fuel cells kind of a very good head on. But of course, in the end, if you kind of summarize the overall equation, you always need to sum up the well-to-wheel 
equation and this well-to-wheel equation is, is again how do you generate um, H2 as well. So that's part of the equation too. Astel, uh, here in the valley, I think there's a general thought about making cars that making electric cars is a lot easier than making internal combustion cars. You made both. Is it easy? Can we do it tonight? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you have factories that have been making combustion engines for uh, almost 100 years, or actually 100 years, it's pretty easy. But if you're starting from scratch and you have to do electric machines, batteries, power electronics, and a combustion engine uh, with, you know, 100 engineers, it's going to be a lot harder, uh, of course, to do this. Why is that? Well, I mean, like you said, like a combustion engine is pretty complex, so if you don't already have a lot of, you know, know-how in-house, it's a, it's it's pretty uh, it's a pretty tough challenge to bring that to your project. Let's say, Christopher, what is the common <coughs> uh, common stumbling block that you see, without naming names, of the of the new and the new automakers that want to do electric? Do you see a common common misstep, or are they over ambitious, or are they not realizing how hard it is to make cars? <laughs> um. I I don't really see. It. That there's any common uh, thing that uh, each company develops its own culture. Um, they face similar challenges, but they attack them in different ways. Um, I think they all have to face um, the fact that they're young companies, um, basically putting together a thousand people within six months or eight months. Uh, that is a challenge. That, that, that challenge they have in common. To form the team and become efficient in what they do. I think that sometimes they underestimate that challenge. Dirk, when does production begin? Our, uh, uh, production, uh, first kind of um, SOP start production is 19, end of 19, beginning of 2020. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, all this works. Finally, just uh, would like to make sure end of 19 we do have a couple of cars on the street. I promise we will. Uh, how many of them we are able to sell? Well, we, we're going we're gonna to see 1920, but I'm, I'm pretty sure latest in 2020 we have a significant number of cars on the road down. And actually, we are approaching first um, China, so our first market will be China. Um, and we're going to approach US and to Europe half a year later. And it's a, it's a brand new factory? It is. We're currently building up a brand new factory in Nanjing, uh, which is kind of two hours train ride from, from China, from, from Shanghai. And I think, well, all the big names, German, U.S. names, are already there. So uh -huh. Bosch, for example, is one of our partners. Some of the other ones are well known as well. So we, we truly believe that, that, you know, playing the Chinese market is a significant portion. We haven't, for example, talked about regulations and about, for example, engagement of, of um, governments, etc. cetera, yet. And I, I truly believe when we talk about enablers and disablers, etc., that's kind of a significant uh, part of it. So if you just look into the portfolio of power trains into you know, established companies and what kind of startup companies try currently, then all of it is very much, you know, focused on, okay, CO2 uh, emission regulations. And that is a significant burden. So I can tell you I've been working on, you know, powertrain strategies for, for a significant uh, amount of time and finally just finding technologies uh, one by one and, you know, trying to predict what customers are going to buy is a very hard job and finally to kind of meet the CO2 regulation uh, targets for, you know, which are out there for 2020, 2025, etc. is very, very hard work. So finally, um, I truly believe that re the regulations play a significant role and especially the, governor, uh, the, the government uh, engagement in China is, is, a, is a huge enabler because um, they currently kind of, for example, invest even in comparison to, to, uh, to California and US significantly more into charging structure, infrastructure and they also have a kind of, a, uh, you know, a very common sense all around the entire uh, governments that they would like to make this happen. And a couple of other factors which are kind of, for example, pro factors are, if you just go into kind of differentiation of different markets, then China has some kind of a benefit of um, simply making regulations happen very, very quickly. So think about autonomous driving as an example. You know, put a, you know, a level four or five capable car into the middle of Beijing and I promise you it won't move. <laughs> because all the others, you know, just will, you know, scrum around it and will make it, you know, just stop. And, you know, if we just, you know, think this a little further, then obviously, um, think about what are the kind of difficult things for autonomous driving. It's like negotiations. So, you know, to the interchange lane, so something like you, you just, you know, have a look to the other driver and make kind of an exchange. You negotiate by eyes. Try this with a computer. You can't. 
The next thing is, for example, in kind of a roundabout, if you just try to cross and would like to maybe exit kind of a, say, two-way you know, uh, roundabout, then <coughs> it's again a look at negotiations. You can't negotiate with a computer like this. So these kind of things are difficult. So what I'm saying is the negotiation between a robot car and a human being is significantly more difficult than if a robot talks to a robot. If that's kind of you no know, standardized, etc., it's easy. So what I'm saying is, if you look at China, for example, you, they just say, okay, that's a smart city, and we just allow level four or five cars only. It's kind of more likely to simply kind of see this earlier. So in terms of enabling and, and disabling, etc., the boundary conditions are significantly different. And uh, as usual, we have mentioned this earlier, it's about very, very many different factors which need to come together, like it's technology maturity, it's price, but it's also things like, you know, um, the governments need to, in the end, give kind of boundary conditions in terms of laws, etc. And getting this in place, uh, plus this, the cultural change which needs to happen to accept certain things, simply usually takes longer time than the technology to be mature enough. Eric, uh, when does production begin for you? It's yeah, I'll not start with, let's make America great again, but... <laughs> but you really love Arizona. <laughs> we really love Arizona, yeah. So our, our intended launch is uh, Q4 of 2020 in Arizona. Um, America is going to be our launch market, and then we're going to go global from then on. Uh, it's going to be in 2020 so that the product has the ripeness. We're just not going to rush it. We are competing with luxury ICE cars, and S-Class has a, a level of refinement that is quite high, and we want to make sure that our customers will experience exactly that. So end of 2020, the ramp up in 2021, uh, a year after, after Biden's launch in China, and uh, yeah, Arizona it is. <laughs> let's, let's, let's talk about charging infrastructure. Uh, it's kind of a mess, a little bit. You know, I get, you know, not to be rude to any charging infrastructure people in the audience, but, uh, you know, and sometimes you go to a, a station and, you know, it's like another network and you're not a member or something, and, you know, what, what needs to occur with charging infrastructure here in the U.S.? Uh, for electric cars, does does the two billion dollars that Volkswagen has to pay to jumpstart electric cars help you all at all? Well, well absolutely, um, <laughs> absolutely. As said, uh, I benefited personally, and so we just recently announced a partnership with Electrify America, which is the company that is going to spend all that money. And it's going to spend it very wisely, and uh, you will all see supercharging or ultra-fast charging stations cropping up all over America. So the, the key thing here is it's not just another Tesla-type charging standard that one, one uh, company can use. It's going to be a charging standard that everybody can, every OEM can benefit from. It's the, the CCS combo connector. We are going to have that on our car. Significantly more OEMs will be um, adhering to the standard, which means every customer can just get at one of those charging stations and charge his car. And up to 300 kilowatt power, that's about three times as much as a Tesla does today. So it's going to be really ultra fast. It's going to be every 80 miles throughout the US. It's going to be particularly dense in about 17 urban areas in the first rollout phase. That goes uh, until end of 2019. So end of next year, there's going to be close to 500 ultra-fast charging stations throughout the entire US. And after that, they still have to spend $1.5 billion. <laughs> so I think it's going to be a, a great charging. One of the things that Tesla would argue is that most customers can charge their vehicle in their garages overnight. Um, do you think that's true? Well, I personally think that's not true for everyone. Uh, it's, it's maybe true in the Bay Area where everybody tries to as a, have a single family home or, or something of the sort. But there are significant areas, maybe even in the city, um, where you have uh, um, high density buildings or skyscrapers and so on, and you just don't have your own parking spot let alone charging spot. So that's why in, in urban areas it, it's going to be particularly important to have more infrastructure availability for the people that have their cars there because they just can't afford or can't get access to a, a charging spot that they own. What do you think, Dirk? 
Uh, I would just like to add a, a different perspective. So, um, you know, times back when you know, we've been here trying to re kind of make the very first um, EV cars work and get people into the car and just you know, try it, and everybody was just about like, okay, how's kind of the driving experience, but nobody was about okay, charging. And when it was kind of a, a scary thing, and they, especially kind of the board members, etc., just tended to say, okay, give me a fully charged car. <laughs> and I actually um, wanted them to make the experience I made which was kind of the very first experience have been disastrous, to be very honest. And so, so I did. So I just simply kind of promised them, yeah, I got a fully charged car, then everybody left, and they would have, have been left alone with a car which was not fully charged, and they just had a short distance to go, and I just wanted them to experience, actually, um, the, the, the charging uh, um, obstacles you usually kind of have. And it exactly, exactly came the way um, what I, I had it before too. So like the first charging station was, was broken. The next one was, okay, I need to register first, but I haven't. Okay, now the other one was, okay, for, for members only. The next one was kind of a supercharger, uh, but it wasn't kind of uh, applicable to, and then you run kind of really short of mileage. And that is what I wanted them to, to finally experience, because that, to my understanding, is the biggest hurdle. The biggest hurdle was not to find the charging station. It was that they don't work, or you don't know they don't work, or they can occupy, or you need to register, or it's not your club, or it's not your premium membership, and so on. So that's, for example, where, where Barton tries to put themselves into place. Some say, okay, again, we use the Barton ID to simply kind of build a network with all the different parties who have already charges in place. So that's exactly what, what Silicon Valley is about. So if you, for example, think about, you know, Eric and myself and, and, and these guys here, and the Tesla guys and all the other ones, we, we rather feel like we are brothers to make the same thing happen. We are not kind of competitors in kind of first row. We try to really kind of, for example, partner wherever possible because I strongly believe charging is an, an, an endeavor which everybody of us needs to finally contribute to. And as usual, kind of a team play, if you don't put anything in, you can't get anything back. So it's a, it's a team play of all the ones who try to make it happen. And finally, here is in the end no differentiation between established OEMs and, uh, and startups. All of us try to make it happen. So that's why we try to partner with everybody. And I very much appreciate that this is possible. <coughs> Pascal, what, did, what have you learned from your early days with the I3? And uh, have you seen any solutions here in the valley? You know, yeah. There's probably a startup that will bring an electric battery to you and charge it to you in your garage. <laughs> uh, actually, there are some startups that do this. But um, I would talk a little bit more. You know, you're talking about like adding a ton of charging station everywhere. And that's a bit of a strain on the utilities. So we are working very closely also with the utilities to uh, do like demand charging and these topics. Like so, we had a project called Charge Forward, where we have about 300 customers, where we can basically control their charging based on the demand from PG&E. Uh, so we can so they enroll in this program, and if there's like a big load on on the electrical grid in the area, we can uh, delay the charging of the customer's car and of course resume the charger the charging at a later at a later point. So this is another point this. Uh, we can't just put charges everywhere and have everyone plug in at the same time and uh, expect everything to be fine, let's say. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, if I may, that, that's a very, very important point. And that's where uh, I think um, economies and people will have to start realizing the big advantage that can be uh, got out of electrification. So not only can you do things like, say, don't charge now or charge at a certain point in time to balance the grid, to, to do peak shaving, take, uh, take power out of the duck curve when the solar panels here in Silicon Valley fire up, uh, but uh, if you have the technology set up right, you can actually use your car as a battery and feed into the grid when the demand is high. So we can do V1G as it's called and V2G, so you can push power in or pull power out and it can be centrally regulated so that the whole, the whole grid will actually be balanced and benefit from that kind of effect. In the end, what we can say with that is not having to buy peak plants that create very dirty peak demand electricity, but we can draw that out of the existing balance of the grid. And that may be stored in electric vehicles or in stationary storage devices. So that's a huge benefit and, uh, and resource that we will be able to tap out on. The same actually will apply to your house. So everybody has seen there's a te Tesla uh, battery for your home, there's the, the Tesla car. 
but right now there is no conclusive home energy management system. <coughs> That's another step that will come. You'll be able to have a home energy management system in your house, which will be able to use the battery in your car, a stationary battery uh, inside your house, and the solar panel and the grid most efficiently that you can be basically net neutral or uh, avoid the the time of use rates and so on. So there's going to be a huge world of benefits that we can tap into in the future as a community. Just as a programming note, we're almost getting to that point in the night when you guys get to ask the real questions. This is just warming them up, so start writing them down and thinking about them. But first, one thing we haven't really talked about tonight is zero to 60 speed. What's it going to be like <laughs> off the line? This has become an important selling feature for some of these electric vehicles in a way that 10 years ago we wouldn't have expected, right? Um, so is the X3 going to just be a Hellcat after off the line? Um, well, it's, I can't really comment on it yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> Was that an important part of the I, I3 and the IA? Well, we wanted the i3 to be pretty sporty uh, compared to the competitors. Uh, so that was one of the motivations. That we have. And there's something, but before we go down the line, though, there's something about an electric car that makes it a lot of fun off the line, right? The, the torque. Sure, yeah, yeah. I mean, once you've driven, like, especially a compact electric vehicle, you really don't really want to go back to a compact combustion engine car. It's, it's awful, like, the experience. Just... <laughs> what, what, is it about, what is it about an electric car that gives you that zero to 60 fun? Yeah, I mean, it's the instant torque. It's the not having any gear shifting. Most EVs, um, it's, yeah, it's just that experience, that instant push uh, torque response. It's, yeah, no ICs can really match that, so. Yeah. Eric, I was in one of your mules uh, maybe 18 months ago and uh, did not, I mean, almost vomited. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it was quite the ride. I think somebody who was sitting next to me actually lost his phone. He was, uh, those kind of experiences. Um, but I, when I've had conversations with some of your executives, they also say, well, it's not all about zero to 60 uh, uh, quickness. Well, we're, we're, how are you a little bit different in that thinking? Yeah, so it's not all about zero to 60 because we could just make a drag racer that uh, converts the power with enough down revving into a crazy insane torque with really wide tires. And so you can optimize for a single point specification. That's not what our car is about. What we want to have is enough acceleration and it's going to be below 2.5 seconds zero to 60 that's what I can say already up to 1000 horsepower and it's going to be true 1000 horsepower or battery pack can sustain that so whether you vomit or not it's going to be fun so the electric mode is really about power not so much torque what you see on the road essentially is great torque but you can tune it via your gear ratio, as I just said. The second topic that makes the fun or the acceleration of electric vehicles so much better than an ICE, regardless of whether you've got a Porsche Turbo or something like that, it has a, a lot of power and a lot of torque, is actually the accuracy with, with which you can control that torque. So the torque in a, in a ICE, basically it slips away the piston's hammer and then your brakes stop it because otherwise you lose traction and then you see the burnout, the Hellcat thing. Right? The electric vehicle uh, has a very high switching frequency for torque control or power control. It's 10,000 hertz and that's why we can basically tweak the actual torque on the road uh, at a 10,000 per second rate and keep that tire engaged with the road all the time. And that's what makes it so absolutely outrageously great. <laughs> Biden doesn't want to go that way. <clears throat> exactly. So, so that's one of our in the end differentiators. And the way, like, what in the end we don't talk about it. As, as an example, I think what, what is fun about electric uh, motors. Uh, so for sure, it's at the end. Uh, well, you're, I don't know whether you've seen kind of you know power curves and torque curves. Um, combustion engines now just reach their nominal um, power and torque right at the end of it when you kind of you know. Uh, 7,000 or 8,000 revolutions per, per, per minute. That's kind of where it sounds like <laughs> So there is where you have your power and your torque. And the fun thing about e-motors is actually that this starts right from zero revolutions per minute. That's that's the fun part of it. So Biden in the end has, has a, you know, a car in place which is 
still, you know, uh, the big version is uh, 350 kilowatts. So it's kind of uh, significantly more than 400 horsepower. So it's not a lame duck, but still, you know, just imagine this scenario. You just go on level four autonomy. We do have, for example, swivel seats in our car. You just turn around to your, to your, uh, you know, best buddy, talk to him, and then you have automatically kind of an insane acceleration of 2.5 seconds in this direction, and you don't know it. It doesn't make sense. So we simply kind of believe that, especially when it goes to say, um, say automated or fully autonomous driving, then the entire acceleration thing will, will pass away, and everything is about okay. Can I make use of the time on board again? We try to position again as a premium brand, so the oil part needs to be premium. And again, we do have the price tag, which is not even half of it. But so we need to kind of consider this still. But um, the differentiation factor, I think, when it comes to autonomous driving, will not any longer be kind of the acceleration, for sure. So that's why I kind of took it out. But here's another, you know, um, another mathematics. Very simply speaking, if, for example, you you bring it up to maximum speed, our positioning currently is we limit it to 180 kilometers per hour. For German, that sounds crazy because I'm used to 250 minimum. But um, if you kind of, for example, consider the difference in terms of technology, like brake system and cooling system, 180 to 250 kilometers per hour means doubling the cooling system and doubling the brake system. And uh, legally, you can't do it anywhere else than just Germany and there in the night. So finally, these are kind of things you need to kind of, for example, if you're kind of price sensitive, need to take out. In a luxury car, they might be different, but for us, that's one of the key things where we just say, okay, we very actively take those ones out because we think it's not going to be a key differentiator. It's going to be just an enabler uh, for the other ones. <coughs> Christian, a, a lot of your competitors in the supply world have been traditionally maybe nervous dealing with startup car companies. Why are you, you, you seem like you're excited to be partnering with them. What are you learning, or what have you learned? What, why is that a good place to be? Because you're not doing the kinds of volumes you're doing with the General Motors or a BMW or a Mercedes. That is true. Um, Bosch has been around for 130 some years. We want to be around a long time in the, in the future. So it's important for us to be where uh, things are happening. Um, this is new technology. It's new types of vehicles. Um, these companies are working with a speed that we're not used to. So for us, this is also learning. And it's important for our future that we can keep up the pace with the fastest in the market. And don't get me wrong, so I can clearly state that Bosch well, is not partnering with everybody. So for a startup, you really need to fight to get the big ones on board. <laughs> Good point. Let's, let's take a couple questions about China and then we'll go to the room. Uh, but here's a statistic, 43% uh, of all electric vehicles uh, built in 2016 were in, in China. Mm -hmm. Is China driving the interest in electric cars? Is it their regulatory or concerns? Um, what's, what's China doing in this market? Well, it's hard with you. <laughs> you know, uh, like well, well, obviously, Martin made kind of a very uh, big um, uh, investment into China and also commitment to China. Because we truly believe um, there's a couple of different aspects which you know, kind of you know um, are um, consequently helping things to happen very very quickly. One of them is, for example, not only the factor of, of um, the law situation and the government, etc., and obviously a serious need if you just go back to air quality, etc. So there is a, a, a kind of a need which everybody can feel and see, but there is also kind of a, a couple of other aspects, for example, like. Uh, the light factor of everything which is new. So the Chinese uh, culture is very much about it's new, it's, it's fancy, I would like to have it. It's even even more than here in Silicon Valley about, you know, hype of new technology is really kind of, uh, everybody would like to go after it. So even if it kind of turns out after quite some time not to be the best or needs to kind of a second generation to get where, where it should be, um, the kind of the, the openness in terms of culture to accept new things and even if the maturity is not yet where it should be is really amazing so that's one of the the key things while we truly believe that you know making the starting point right there and also kind of at the right price, posi price position was um, the two key things to do um, tell me about some what are some of the incentives in, in China if I'm a consumer there's Special license plates. There's special costs reductions. What are what are just a list of some of the things that are helping drive interest? 
well, the, the, there's kind of a long list, which is kind of, uh, I guess, long enough to talk about it for, for two evenings. Um, so this the is end a two-parter. This is going to be going on all night. <laughs> <laughs> so, so very simply speaking, yes. So for example, current situation is if you buy a kind of license plate, then you might not get a license plate uh, right away. You might wait for, for a couple of years because you need to win a lottery. And if you won the lottery, then you might need to figure out whether your last figure is bought or even, and then you're kind of allowed to go just to know Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and Sunday, or the, the odd numbers, and the other days, etc. So that kind of really kind of brings down the value of your car completely and significantly. So the only way to kind of get, for example, very quickly a, a, a license plate is actually you can buy a car, but if you don't get a license plate, is maybe, uh, for example, to buy an EV car. So that is one of the key things. Another thing is, uh, for example, look, to, look not into China, but also to, for example, uh, Scandinavia, free charging, free parking spots, and so on and so on. If, for example, parking spots right in front of these shops instead of behind it, and so on and so on. So the, the list of all of that is very, very long. If you go into not only customer view, but swap perspective back to kind of OEM, manufacturing costs, etc., then obviously you get lots of subsidies. Also, if you build up fleets, um, you get lots of subsidies if you build up a plant, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. So that is well known in every country. Um, but uh, China is doing that very, very consequently, not thinking kind of only the first wave, but also what is behind. So as everybody does, like, okay, if you have an OEM, then you build tier ones around them, like Bosch and others, and then you've got the, the energy system around it, and then you've got the consumer electronics around it, which is interacting with it, then you've got the cloud computing, which is connected to that. So it's, in the end, an ecosystem. And what is kind of, um, kind of very kind of systematically done in China is this ecosystem thinking. And uh, I, we do have, I guess, uh, similar ways of thinking in, in Silicon Valley and also in, in Europe to a certain extent. But the braveness of you know, putting risk money and risk investment into that in China is amazingly high. If I may add to that, I see that actually as uh, one of the huge incentives to go to China. Every single OEM has a go to China strategy. Uh, all the big U.S. <coughs> and car companies have, have uh, uh, joint ventures there. And it's the world's largest market for cars in, in general. Now, of course, it's to be expected yeah, that it's going to be the largest EV market too. On the other hand, they are very consequently, as Dirk just said, um, supporting the onset of the electrification. And uh, if I spin it from a, from a slightly different perspective than just seeing, wow, that's a great opportunity for us, um, they are, they are basically changing their economy from inherited or bought in external ICE products to a completely <coughs> China sustained, sustained uh, economy. They don't need anybody anymore from the outside. They've got 470 EV startups there. They've got a couple from Silicon Valley or with Silicon Valley uh, outfits and so on, but they've got 470 in the country or something like that that we've counted. Not all of them will make it. But I think if 10% make it, they are, they are in a position to take over from the old established supply chains that benefited all these other companies. So I think it's a, it's a strategic move, maybe government incentivized. It's a, an absolutely right move because they have ecological problems and electric vehicles, as we know, are going to be cleaner as long as they also bring up their uh, coal generated power infrastructure from a cleanliness level. Mm -hmm. But, but I, I see that it is partially a huge risk to the established OEMs, not necessarily us. But everybody needs to have a good China plan. Okay, any question? Raise your hand and try to. Okay, just a couple. Uh, there we go. Let's, uh, let's start here and we'll work our way, so. Like, yeah, you. Um, I have a question. Maybe you could inter announce your name and where you're from or something like that. Yeah, I'm, my name is Peter Graf. I'm from Germany, and I'm not Steffi's dad. Um, <laughs> the, the question I have is the, the whole time we talked about charging is a disadvantage. So you have to bring the car to the station. Uh, while electrons fly at the speed of light, you can bring them anywhere. I just drove down from Frankfurt to Karlsruhe recently. I saw all the electrification they put in for the, for the, for the trucks in Germany, which is awesome to see. From a, from a manufacturer's OEM perspective, what are, the, what are the hurdles, what needs to happen to rethink the charging and maybe do induction charging or anything that fills the car up while it's driving? Because I think that could solve a lot of the you know, uh, hesitation in, 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 in the population about the electric cars. 
I just give one part of the of the answer. Um, to my understanding, it kind of completely <coughs> depends on again the use case. So just an example uh, in Europe, for example, there uh, Scandinavia and also Southern Europe and, and Central Europe, for example, find a couple of you know <coughs> highway lanes which are kind of completely equipped already with with charging. We do have kind of test tracks for inductive charging, etc. We've got kind of landlines which you can use with you know trucks, etc. And all of that kind of works pretty well as long as the um, the, the kind of um, utilization of that is high enough. Just saying, I just try to, uh, whenever I kind of discuss that, I compare it with, for example, if you, for example, just think about um, you know just uh, mail service or you know postal service like this, and just you know let this happen like a like a standard kind of economy, like people requesting for it, people paying for it, okay. They always end up with a coverage which only covers kind of the, the main highways and everything else kind of is drying out, which doesn't solve the problem, so, or just partly solves it. So I think if you just come back to what's kind of the biggest hurdle of that is very simply speaking that never, you, know, you don't need to consider whether it's kind of conductive or, or inductive, the investments are very significant. So for example, OEMs like us, we, we can't invest in the entire world uh, to make kind of charging systems get there. So that's why it definitely needs standardization and uh, the team play of everybody to make this happen. Also, a single government usually can't afford. So it's in the end, to my, in, to my, to my understanding, the key point is really that the investment is very high and you need team play and standardization, otherwise it won't happen. Or you just find solutions which are particularly for this case or for this route. But uh, in terms of technology, there are very many different ones. Maybe somebody would say? Anybody else? Well, as you mentioned, these uh, these uh, power lines on the autobahn that will be used by experimental trucks and so on, uh, they are not necessarily applicable to us as, as car drivers. We will not have a huge underground that goes up and so on. So we'll have to find the right technology if we really want to implement it. That's not the right one. Inductive charging, there are many trials going on. Whether it makes sense to actually outfit the infrastructure with that once you can charge fast enough. Because a big battery can actually charge a, a large amount of range really, really fast. The CCS standard, as I said, uh, goes up to 350 kilowatt already. The next step is going to be 500 kilowatt. And at that level, you're thinking about 5 to 11 minutes for a complete charge of three, 400 miles of range. That's insane. That's basically the same as if you gas up. Now, do you really need to spot the whole country with other infrastructure if you're at that level. The use case is not every single day. Germany has the autobahn, that's awesome and, I, and we love it. That's where you deplete the battery significantly faster than anywhere else in the world because you've got the aero effect, right? So the faster you drive, the more energy it consumes and that's why you may need to charge more often. In the States, uh, after four or five hours of driving continuously, 70 miles I typically like pulling off to the next Starbucks sign or something um, and have a quick break and then I can charge and the thing is completely full before I even get into the car. So I think there's going to be this adoption topic. People will have to get into it, use it and see whether they, they can live with it. At Tesla, part of the DOE uh, loan requirements was to set up a, a swapping station. And if you recall, and you've seen the videos, Tesla showed that they can swap a battery in 90 seconds. Yes, it's all doable, but how many people really want it and need it? I mean, the infrastructure invest is just outrageous. And if we think about it, we don't really need it. Uh, so that's maybe my point. Yeah. I think battery technology will evolve. Um, range will go up just because of the batteries getting better. So that problem will diminish over time. And the fast charging repeatability and stability of the packs. <coughs> so, for instance, Lucid, we've said we can charge 1,000 times with about 3 to 5% degradation. That's nothing 1,000 times. 400 miles is 400,000 miles on a vehicle. I don't know whether anybody in this room has a car that has 400,000 miles on its odometer. So we can sacrifice a little bit of that for faster charging because faster charging hurts the batteries as, as they are right now. Future batteries will be more charging resistant and, and actually drive those times down significantly. Okay, let's take another question from the crowd. 
you look excited for Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm just uh, Brian was in Finney Realm, we built power systems. In fact, I developed the first lithium ion safety chip in 97 that Bosch didn't want to buy. Uh, but anyway, I think this discussion is very exciting because what Peter mentioned is kind of a very simple math, right? and I, I, I see you pushing the envelope, but really, are we not looking and betting on the wrong horse? Energy density lithium ion 2.5 megajoules per kilogram for the nerds, solid state 5, diesel, I know we don't like it, 34, mm -hmm. 71 ratio. Unless you overcome the density by an order of magnitude, which the chemistry unfortunately will not support, this is physically not possible, you're betting on the wrong course. Better places was there, 2012 in Germany, presented, failed. If you have a mass adoption, you have to make it convenient, not 12 minutes, but 6 minutes charge. I don't see how you get there. I mean, sometimes something doesn't not match up. Aren't you scared of something, or isn't a big piece missing to get it from early adopters to actually early majority? Since that's what we need to do, we cannot change user behavior, you know, the innovation dilemma. Well, maybe the, the answer to that is, how often per week do you gas up? How often per week would you have to fast charge? Typically, you charge at home or once a week. If Only you if you travel constantly will you see a difference between 6 and 11 minutes. If you have two vehicles, that will be great. But most Americans don't have micro vehicles. Most, most Germans don't even have a plug to charge. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that is true. So, so maybe just I, a couple of different aspects coming back to the to, to the question. So if, we, if you just compare the kind of energy density, you're completely right. That, that is indeed true. So we could come, for example, come back with a fuel cell, so okay, that kind of goes to the right direction, at least in terms of, in the end, what, what is the nice thing about, you know, fuel? It's in the end, the independency. Yeah, so in the end, we're paying for independency. So here's a, in, a, one aspect with, which I see currently being the ruling one. One is very simply speaking, do you get kind of the amount of energy <coughs> for this independency on board, yes or no? And lithium ion currently gets us at least to the point where we can get enough energy on board for this, <coughs> say, independence of 400 miles or something. So this this independence is at least something you can you can you can carry. And when you when it goes to solid state, I'm for sure you know well, weight go down. Well, it's again another plan because you you change uh, the entire industrialization of that. So it's a great chance, for example, for for new competitors to come in. Um, so there's a, there's a great chance that new competition comes up, and not only the whole players are going to kind of make it direct the race. So I think the tipping point or the, the key kind of um, thing which says, okay, it's possible, is not is kind of, can you carry enough energy on board? And I think in that terms, you're right, there's still kind of a huge difference in terms of energy density, but it's enough energy, you need to have this, in, uh, to have this independent, independency. But on the other side, I think there's a second factor, which we haven't figured out um, this entire evening. So I just was you know, looking across the entire lines and trying to figure out where's my age you know, compared to the average of this room. Uh, because I just uh, was thinking about, okay, um, there's kind of a huge discrepancy, like how I consider a car, and how, for example, my children's generation is doing. So I have a couple of, you know, you know, friends and their children, you know, they're not kind of not even trying to make their driving license. They just would like to have kind of a membership card for for mobility. They do not, you know, seek to own a car, not at all. They do not even want to drive it. They just, you know, say, okay, I would like to have mobility. Yes, I would like to have my drinks. I don't want to drink and drive. I just would like to have my mobility card. And then it goes to kind of totally different directions, and then you don't care too much about this energy thing again. If you get, for example, a chance for, you know, drive sharing, etc., and to have simply enough time to in the end, recharge the car. So that changes the entire um, use case as well. So if you kind of take these two things together to simply say, okay, I think battery technology, well, let's not forget, combustion engine and the current efficiency we have in the combustion engine is a result of 100 years of engineering. Mm -hmm. If you go back to batteries, I know during World War II and first we had a couple of you know, very you know, uh, genius experts working on batteries, but you know, since then, 70 years, not too much happened. But if you now look what happened, for example, during the last 5 to 10 years, that you know, increases really kind of significant. So what I truly believe is we are at the point where we get enough energy on board there are a couple of range extender ideas, like for example, fuel cell, etc., which kind of bring enough energy on board for this. But if you change the, the, the use case towards, okay, I just have a kind of a mobility voucher, 
then I think the, the, the answer is, okay, electricity might be good enough. Then the entire question turns just into, okay, are we able to finally produce clean enough energy in terms of electrical energy? Okay, I think we're, we're almost running out of time, but let's take one last question in the back there all the way. Um, my name is Sarah. My first car was a 1986 Plymouth Reliance. And if you've driven a worse car than that, I'll buy you a beer. <laughs> so along the lines of barking up the wrong tree or betting on the wrong horse, I see a lot of EVs building a sports car, building a sedan. Um, you've mentioned range anxiety is, is a prohibiting factor for people getting into the market. My understanding is that almost half the U.S. market is currently a light truck. Is it not dominated by the Ford F-150? Is that wrong? Um, so is, could it just be that people don't want a sedan? And why aren't we building a truck? Well, well obviously, uh, uh, the truck is absolutely right for the U.S. and many other regions in the world. And uh, there are actually startups that are doing exactly that already. Um, yeah, who knows in the future, but if you look at the portfolio of cars that are, is sold every single day, there is enough sedans or enough hatchbacks, enough whatever we can build in our first years. So in order to become a real OEM that is being taken serious, you are not going to start with one million vehicles or two million vehicles a year. <coughs> so you have to be realistic about what you can actually stem. It's a capital intensive business and you do have to say 100 years of automotive building history has given the established OEMs a lot of knowledge. So a startup has to focus on one segment, one vehicle ideally, uh, at a reasonable and manageable volume. We think a sedan will definitely sell uh, the volumes we will be able to build in a couple of years. Parallelization of projects is possible if you've got a strong funding backer or if the capital markets uh, give you the funding to do so. And who knows, maybe there is a, a product on the portfolio highlight uh, timeline. Well, I'll give maybe a slightly different answer uh, to that. So first of all, indeed, a lot of duty trucks here in the US is kind of a totally different segment. Uh, so, for example, the, the approach Barton chose was actually kind of a different one. We just said, okay, we really focus on a platform because we, we truly believe if you need economy of, well, finally, if you would like to manage the costs, you need to go for a certain economy of scale, otherwise no chance. So that's why we focus on build a platform, which we can currently use for a sedan, an SUV, and for an MPV. So we are even preparing for an MPV. Why? For example, in China, one of the big use cases, which is kind of completely unusual here in Europe, is the seven-seater. It's kind of a big honor to, to carry your grandparents uh, on the weekend. So everybody needs a seven-seater. It's kind of a, a quite, quite, quite a market in China, but nobody cares about it in Europe or in US. So that's one of the things we just try to really kind of approach this niche market as well. But if, you, if it goes back to, for example, is there a hurdle, for example, to take the technology and transfer it to the large duty trucks? And the very simple answer is there's no reason why not to transfer it. And um, the biggest question for engineers is, does the package work out? So if you get all the kind of parts assembled in the envelope, then obviously a large duty truck is significantly easier to package. So I think there's a good message in it too. I just wanted to add, um, I'm absolutely sure you will see companies developing uh, electrical pickups and uh, electrical SUVs. For sure. Uh, X3 is going to be an SUV. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 well, <that's yes>. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we should give them a round of applause. And Let's also thank Tim for some great moderation. much all of my questions. I conclude we're still kind of in that phase where we're pushing the ball up over the tip.